I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome to the Playing FTSE podcast. My name's Paul and each episode, me and the lads get together to talk about the stocks, stock market news and finance in general. Quick disclaimer, you shouldn't consider anything in this podcast as personal financial advice. If you need such advice, go to a financial advisor. And please remember when investing in any form, your capital is at risk. So sit back, relax, and let the lads fill you in with all the stock market news of the week. The sucker's going up. Welcome to the Midweek Footsie. Uh, this week we have Damien uh, from Damien Talks Money on the Midweek Footsie. So we're going to do a little quick question every week. We just, midweek, we answer a little question from the comments or anywhere else we've gathered these questions from. And Damien's going to chime in this week as well. So, Steve D, take us through the question. So the question this week is from, uh, it sort of comes from within really, it's uh, recently a, a close family member asked me if I would be interested in um, managing money for uh, both him and his wife. And uh, that just really got me thinking about, mate. I mean, the answer for me, I'll, I'll come clean, was, was no. But I wondered how you guys feel about it. And I think a few of us here manage money for perhaps wives or help help wives with accounts. And certainly some of us manage money for kids. So I was wondering where the book stops with you guys. Where do you, at what point do you guys go, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And, and then which bits do you guys feel is, is okay? Damien, do you want to lead us off? So, I mean, for a family member that wasn't a child or someone that, you know, I was romantically involved in, the answer would be no every single time, I think. I don't... I, would, I wouldn't want to manage someone else's money for them. I think there's a lot of pressure associated with that. Sorry, can you hear my cat sneezing? I don't know if that's coming over the mic, but my cat's just having a little <laughs> sneeze. I manage his money, so he's sound. <laughs> like, you know, uh, but yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got my, my little boy and I've got a, a junior icer and a junior sip. And I see that as like, that's when he turns 20 odd, he can blow that on a Fiat Punto and go booze and then I know that at retirement which could be grim for him you know in 60 years what's that going to look like for kids I know that there's going to be a nest egg there so I'll do that but managing it for family I get a lot of you know people mates what should I buy what should I buy I'm just inclined to be like you should probably just look at index funds and do it long term consistently and and get into it from there here he is Oh, he He looks like he wants to take over the world. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I feel like I should go get my cat now. Yeah, (laughs) uh, yeah, let's go get. (laughs) Um, So yeah, with um, managing people's money. So I've got, I've I've got mixed mixed views on it. Um, First of all, I see my dad's pension. And I'm hoping he never watches this, but I think that he's making a lot of big mistakes in that pension, which are just glaring in the office. As simple as, you know, sort of having a financial advisor advisor take, I think it was like 8% from him um, to to set it up with with some sort of Aviva fund. And I'm just like, oh my God, why don't we do, why don't we just bring this out? Because everybody knows that... uh, Fees are the worst thing. Fees are negatively compounding. And so we, we should be avoiding these fees. And I just feel like, oh, God, should I be doing it? But I know it's not my place to, to sort of say to him that this is what you should be doing instead. And uh, obviously, he doesn't understand that I do this. So uh, he just thinks I'm an idiot as well. And most people think I'm an idiot. But that's 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 by the by. Um but for my kids, I've kind of got a different idea to you, Damien, because I kind of remember myself at 18 and I had a little Halifax account, which had ended up having like four grand in it. And I just blew it. I was supposed to have it on a laptop, uh, which is long gone now. And I just kind of think when you're 18, you're making stupid choices. And also, I don't have a lot of money myself. So... I think I've said this before. I think I said this before to Sven Carlin. Um, I would rather put the oxygen mask on myself first rather than putting it on my children. So rather than splitting it, I'm, I'd rather get the compounding going for myself. But I, I, I do totally understand uh, why you do that. And I like the idea of a junior sip as well. I, I like the idea of um, the 
Monish Pabrai had a has a good thing. I watched another video of him uh, today, and he said that he just put four grand in what is essentially a, a junior sip uh, for his daughter. And you use the rule of seventy two. By the time that's uh, by the time they're sixty, they're going to be like it's going to be like four hundred grand. It's probably going to be more if we consider the uh, future growth of what whatever. Um, I I don't know though. I'm I'm just finding it very hard to make this decision and give up my own compounding now in favour for for his compounding so I could, going I forward. Would count- I would counter that by maybe saying that the child's going to be a financial burden regardless. So by putting the money aside for when they're 18 to 21, that is for me. That's not for my child as such. It's for me to, uh, I'll, put, I'll, you know, I'll, be, I'll be hanging over him and saying it's for a deposit for a house and that's it. Uh, hopefully encouraging him as yeah. well to look at it and continue to invest. But I think, you know, you're going to have those costs, aren't you, when the child turns to a certain age. I think you, you're letting the compounding work for you by having it in a dedicated account as such. Because I won't want to touch my ISA when my son turns 18. I like I, I never want to yeah. touch it. Yeah, that's the idea. Now, don't interrupt your compounding is is the basic mm-hmm. lesson here, I suppose. But for for other family members, I and and other people really, because yeah, being on YouTube and I don't know if Damien ever recommends stocks or anything like that. And I know we talk about stocks quite a bit on here. Um, we are sort of having a small influence i don't like to say that we've got a big influence because it's very very small but we are sort of dishing out information which could be here or there and i don't have a problem with it i know some people do have a problem with it but i don't have a problem with it because i think i do i think i'm doing the best that i can and i'm also doing the same things that i would do for myself so dealing that and giving that advice i don't really have a problem with as such um Obviously, ad- advice is a, is a loose term here. Uh, but doing it for family members, I don't think I'd have a problem. And I don't know if that's just because I've da- detached myself from this emotion. My job, uh, I make quite big decisions daily for, for certain people and uh, arguably maybe slightly bigger decisions for, for people. And I completely detach my, myself from that. I, I take the knowledge that I have and I have to, I, I make some sort of decision and uh yeah it's kind of fine with me so i don't know if any of you guys have have different views on that but yeah i don't really i wouldn't really have a problem i think one thing that strikes me as slightly different sorry by the way i got a little bit tangled up a couple of minutes ago i was looking on the floor for sven carlin's name that paul just dropped all over it but, um <laughs> but uh steve d's question was originally about managing money for family and it feels to me like there's a difference at least in how i feel about things in terms of managing money for family which kind of sounds to me like they kind of give you their money and then you go and do something with it versus something more kind of advisory, like saying what I'm planning on doing with my money or here's a thing I read about bonds or here's what a bunch of people seem to think about stuff. The idea that I might kind of provide someone with some information, even knowing that realistically what they're going to do is take my information like it's somehow really valuable and then go and use it versus actually taking their money and investing it kind of with my money. They feel like quite different things to me and I feel significantly less easy about the second one. So even when I'm thinking of kids or something uh and the kind of godsons that i have kind of money that i've invested for that's always been kind of money that i've been gifting to them so the money was kind of never theirs before i feel differently about someone saying please take this part of your godson's money and invest it as you see fit i would i would run quite scared of that idea i don't mind saying i'm going to gift you some money and i'm going to stick it into general motors for the time being because you really like cars or something like that (laughs) Uh, yeah, and and I suppose investing for different people at different age and different journeys in their investment uh, careers, whatever you want to call it, they they all think differently as well. Like I know Steve W has quite a conservative, tends to be communi- consumer stable, staply type businesses, and that's how he chooses to invest. But I'm pretty sure that. For the younger people in your generation that you've sort of, uh, see, it's one of you that have done it for like a godson or something like that. You put it into Disney has, yeah. and things like that. Steve yeah. has on that, yeah. You, you put it into more uh, growth orientated stuff and maybe uh, longevity type stuff. And, and and for me, like somebody who would come to me after, after 50 years of saving up in their pension and saying, um, oh, can you do something with this? I suppose they would have to have a different um, mindset 
you would have to have a different mindset to deal with their their way that you that you not going not ever going through that particular point in your life would have to kind of resonate with and i find that odd for financial advisors advisors sometimes that they theoretically know what the best thing to do for a person who's heading into retirement is but they still don't they've never experienced the mindset and it's quite quite interesting the mindset and i also uh just to add on to that i've got this whole like video idea that i've got in place at the moment i'm writing it's about the idea of just invest in index funds um uh, like saying to someone just invest in an index fund and i think that's quite um i think that's too simplistic i think there's so much mindset involved in investing that if you were to say to somebody just invest in an index fund or something like that it they they still need to understand that stocks go up and down uh your money could really disappear uh it could half by 50 percent in the next couple of months uh they they still need to know these things because uh, when it comes down to it, they still have their finger over the sell button and they still have, have to be able to make that choice. It, it, it's more than that, isn't it, though, as well? Because it's what we've always sort of said about is that telling somebody to do something doesn't build conviction. It's the same when you watch somebody on YouTube, and I think you've touched on this in a couple of videos, really, Damien, in that knowing follow is probably why you don't really talk about your individual stocks. Well, I think you said that basically is that you could tell people about individual stocks that you're buying, but that won't build conviction in them. And when the market crashes, you'll feel fine about what you hold and uh, they yeah. probably won't. And, and that's the kind of idea that I've got with, with the person who asked me, I thought, well, look, I could put you onto a, a whole host of stocks that I think in the next 10 years will do fine. But the idea is that the volatility is very difficult to stomach, especially when you don't know about these companies. Like I'm, I'm down 30% on Teladoc at the moment. And um, that's a bit of a running joke between us uh, off camera, but um, I'm perfectly fine with that. I have absolutely no worries that I think Teladoc will be a fantastic company in 10 years time. So I don't have to but that difference is is that i'm probably a thousand pound down on teledoc at the moment and if i was having to tell somebody oh by the way that investment i made you've lost a third of it uh that's a different story the other thing i'm just going to caveat on i'll add a little bit of color in it is that the person who asked me followed me into greatland gold when i was writing oh. for um, a certain pink broker um that shite and i uh, <laughs> <laughs> and i um I obviously told him, you know, you should try this. It's, it looks quite interesting. We got in at 1.6p and we got out at 30p. So nice. there is an expectation there that I'm going to pull some kind of rabbit out of the hat there, which was basically, I mean, obviously I saw I saw that as a, as a way of playing a bit of a goldmine arbitrage sort of moment there, but it's, uh, it, it's not going to be like that probably ever again um it's not in the short space of time either so it's it's a tricky sort of situation go, go on Steve. sorry i, I keep no i was again gonna say nothing helpful just to be fair if you'd invested my money and were down 30 percent, and i had to listen to you talking about asml every week i would do my nut as well <laughs> <laughs> well to be fair even after the crash we're still up 65 percent on asml since the time yeah. i told paul to have a look at it so i think, in fact, I think... We're, up, we're up over 100 percent since the time i told paul to look at it but um <laughs> so i've bought it again since then I think you hit the nail on the head with the expectation thing, though. I think the kind of person that would come to me and go, I'll give you money to invest for me, probably doesn't have realistic expectations about what I could do with that money. And I might come back after a year and go, oh, I, I made you 9%, mate. And they'd be like, what? I thought you were going to treble my money in a year. So I think yeah. that's why Where's I would want to touch you personally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I just think the expectations. <laughs> and they, they obviously think investing is quite hard as well, whereas... It is hard to be a good investor, but to invest as in to put your money into the market, you see your dad paying 8% fees there. My mom paid 5% with SJP to invest in life strategy funds, essentially, when I looked at it. And it was basically because the perception is this is really hard to do, you know, where in reality, it's it's mm -hmm. not that hard to, to do those broad indexes. So that's why I would never touch someone else's money and invest it. I think the expectations are well out of whack with what what is... What I'd yeah, have but would you would you want would you want your mum to be paying five percent when you know she, you know oh she's, no she's losing five percent so but this is what did Steve you w do said. anything this, about that or yeah yeah and like what yeah. i did was i set up a youtube channel <laughs> and then my mum started listening to me because <laughs> after, after she, she basically was like what do you know damien you know like these guys are professionals yeah. footsie 100 company i set up a youtube channel and she watched the videos and she's like oh okay actually and now she's set up a vanguard account for herself and and stuff and all great that kind of thing and she's saving loads yeah. of fees but it's like what steve w yeah. was saying it's 
given general like this is what's sensible to do versus take i'll take your cash and invest it like i wouldn't bet with someone else's money in a casino i wouldn't invest with someone else's money either you know that's kind of how i see it yeah fair enough yeah fair so enough. If, if if someone was to ask you then what would you guys do instead so if somebody comes to you and says hey i want you to invest my money i just said no i don't think that's a very sensible idea but i'm thinking now probably on the lines of i would probably recommend them down the sort, same sort of path i went down which was skipping youtube sorry paul sorry damien and i read um tim hill smarter investing that was that was one of the first books i i ever read and it was a sort of a chronicle on um on index investing which um sort of got me on the path of I've, well, obviously, I was investing in the, just after the 2008 financial crash as well, which felt like um, it was uh, it was kind of a risky sort of period. But th- that was the book that I think really got me the most interested in index funds because there is that element of, I, and I've always whinged about it on here that the FCA sort of double edged sword you all the time with that um, that that the past performance is not indicative of future performance and all the other kind of warnings. Your capitals and the at risk, risk score and by and apply. Yeah. Exactly. And when you start yeah. looking at things like that, you think, right, well, I'm going to lose money because I do not know what I'm doing. But actually, historically, and the longer you hold onto an index fund, it's almost impossible to lose money, especially if you invest in something like the S&P. Historically, yeah. the longer you hold, it becomes more and more impossible to lose money. And that's something that really resonated with me. And then, obviously, it was about, for me, it's something I've always seen. You maybe not come across it, Damien, but I said... You've got to do what makes you interested in it. So if it's index investing and you can get really, really excited about index investing and that maximizes the amount that you will save, incentivizes you to save, yeah. then you're on to a real winner. But for me, it's too boring. And if yeah. I was only index investing, I'd put 100 quid a month away. I'd put 150 quid a month away and that would maximize it. In stocks, I can put six, seven hundred pound a month away. Now I'm getting better and better at stock picking as it as it uh, as it goes on. I'm getting better and better at reading company statements. At least I think I am, um, and I think I'll be able to maybe not beat the return of an index. But that's not part of it because I think at the stages that we're all at here, the amount you input is far more important than the amount that you, you return. Um, so that's kind of the thing that I always say here is you've got to try and find what keeps you interested. And I think that's the same with people asking you to manage money on their behalf. If yeah. they're just going to give you a hundred quid and say, try your best to get this, it's not enough. It's going to be, it's going to be too tricky to do. You need to really get them interested and get them to find a way that maximizes their return. And input. exactly what I was going to say, because anybody who's coming to you to say, Oh, can you invest this money for me? You obviously look like you know what you're doing. They're looking for an easy way out of this. And it's very simple. Behavioral finance says that there isn't an easy way out of this. You are going to lose some money at some point and you've got to have the stomach to push through it. So, yeah, I think you're, you're right there is um, when I really try and put myself in the shoes of someone who's being asked to um, uh, invest with someone, I think I would send them away and say, look, this is really scary and this is really, really hard to do. And you've got to, you've got to understand the markets. I was at, a, I was at a, a dinner with two people the other day and they started talking about, um, <laughs> this is all giving away this video now, but they all started talking about, um, finances and how much money they've kind of saved up over lockdown. And I was sitting there like that meme, like, Ugh! like trying to, <laughs> to go, oh, I know the answer. I know what you're supposed to do. Like broad, just invest in a broad based index fund. They were like, what what's that and i'm like well technically and then and then you've got like half an hour to an hour of just teaching them the basics of how yeah. uh, the stock markets work and brokers and blah 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 and and then and it was at that point i realized this is gonna be too hard to fit into a lunch these guys have to really go out and learn themselves they've got to figure this out themselves because they're the only ones in in reality that are control controlling your money and it's the whole Michael Burry thing again to 2008. It's the uh, Manish Pabri thing in uh, 2015, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, th- these investors are pulling out because there's a little bit of bad news. And long term, everyone knows it works. And it's all about understanding. It's all about behavior. And I think that somebody who's coming to, yeah, I think that somebody who's coming to you to look for them to invest, they're looking for the easy route and there isn't one. I think almost everyone uh, should have to invest in index funds for two years before they can even touch individual stocks. Because I think so many people start with the individual companies, get burnt, and then just go, yeah, not for me, that. It's like how many people have been introduced to investing through Doge and think that that is investing? I see it in my comments all the yeah. time. 
But we yeah. we sort of advocate. We we've been talking about core and satellite before, which having a core portfolio, which is your index funds, and having this a is what I do. Yeah, that I have core satellite. You play yeah. with and, and and that helps you out. I, I mean, I switch to core and satellite, but I core with safer stocks rather than index funds. But it is what it is. For I me, guess. it reflects my confidence in my ability to pick individual businesses because if I if I knew exactly what I'd do, and I'd only invest in one business at a time, the business that I thought was going to rise more than any other. So my my way into index funds just reflects my confidence in my own ability to pick individual stocks at the time. You know, so that started off as a hundred percent, went down tonight. I'm probably about sixty forty now. You know, that's kind of where I sit. You see, I think there's no there's no problem with that because you're back in broader prosperity, aren't you? Basically, if you yeah. back if you buy something like uh, Vanguard's Global All Cap, you're mm-hmm. saying I think the world will be a greater place. I think in yeah. ten years' time that you know that the world will prosper. But what you're saying when you're buying an individual company is you think this company specifically will prosper in that environment. So there's no reason why you can't back the whole. Uh, the whole idea uh, as a general sort of view and then individually say this company as well will do really well i don't see any problem to that i I don't know what you guys think yeah i mean i've always thought of building uh once they raise the limit of pies building an s&p 500 pie and then just getting rid of tobacco getting rid of oil getting rid of you know chopping off the obvious stuff that isn't going to do very well in 30 years what and... what you need paul is the catholic etf beat me to it the trouble with the catholic <laughs> etf is it has fees attached to it i think so paul's going to end up paying uh, yeah, them out exactly yeah you can't be doing the how fees can you so uh, I... how about this one for a ticker slim s-l-i-m talking about etfs what's slim oh um Ooh. is that gonna be a health thing is that gonna be a health etf it's pretty no. funny this one, to be fair. It's going to be some index thing. <laughs> I think it's probably cigarettes, is it? Is that a cigarette it, ETF? It's, it's an ETF that directly benefits from companies that target obese people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it. it's called, called Slim. Wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah. so what, Coca-Cola's in there? Um, no, no. Are any so pharmaceuticals like treats, in there? So- supplements i think weight watchers and stuff like that like um oh right so it's... so it's like a health thing it's like health, uh, yeah. like health being there and stuff like that weight. yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. i thought i thought it was the opposite way because that would be a really oh, good no. esg <laughs> fund is it is, yeah. is it like so everybody people use knows hangers a lot then <laughs> what was that <laughs> Oh, I was on joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Was, uh, that was a really loose Peloton joke that was not going to land at all. Oh, about about the clothing. <laughs> until... You're hanging, hanging yeah, clothing yeah, on yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've got this. I, I, want, I want to create like a little little racks that like go on Pelotons so people can hang their clothes <laughs> on the racks on the Pelotons rather than directly over the Pelotons. Uh, that's what I want to see. Uh, I, I think there's a business uh, idea in that. Um, a firm yeah, but, will give uh, a discount as oh, well. Oh, no, I... The, the firm will let them pay, <laughs> yeah. pay in installments. Well, I was, I was thinking... Peloton's biggest client. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I'll, I'll find out some way to do some recurring revenue on it somehow. I've, I've really got, it, got a clue how to do that. But I, I, was, a service. I was thinking that'd be a great <laughs> ETF to uh, target people who benefit from obesity. So you've got, like, the most horrible ETF out there from an ESG <laughs> perspective. But it probably makes a lot of money. Like, let's let's not doubt it. It probably makes quite a lot of money. So Coca-Cola, McDonald's, um, you'd have uh, all the smoking ones in there. You'd have pharmaceuticals that uh, deal in... Sur- you have surgery, surgical stuff. Like, well, no, that'd be the opposite one, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Uh, uh, intuitive sur- surgical giving uh, gastric bands and stuff. Anything you can just shove in there and thumb in, like um, <laughs> anything. Thumb in again. All right. Mm. Yeah. Oh, God. Keep, keep saying stupid stuff there. Right. Are we done there? Have we covered this family thing? <laughs> I think we, about 10 minutes just... ago, Steve said wrap us up. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we went which, down is where yeah, be, yeah sorry. which is where I'll be cutting it. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. We did 20 minutes. 25 minutes was the last one. It's, it's great. People, people, they listen to us. And uh, thank you to Arthur. Is it Arthur Shelby who wanted the um, podcast on? Uh, he wanted it onto the, the midweek puts the onto the actual podcast thing. So that has been done for you. On Spotify, Arthur, yeah. And you were low, yeah. It's been put onto Spotify. So uh, thank you very much for everyone tuning into the Midweek Footsie. Thank you for, to Damien for being with us today from Damien Talks Money. Go see his YouTube channel. It's, uh, it's 
it's excellent. Um, I've said it all on the on the other <laughs> on the other video. <laughs> I'll have to go again. But the, the, the also a compliment, mm-hmm. Paul. <laughs> oh, it's maybe, excellent. Maybe maybe mention Stan Carlin a few more times while he's here. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, you know how it is. I go if you tuned into the Play Fussy podcast the days before that you should have seen how bad that would have ended. So I, I can only, I've got two speeds. I've either got oh, excellent or I've got uh, thumb it in, Johnny quickly, and all that sort of stuff. Right. So thank you very much, everyone, for <laughs> listening to the Midweek Fussy. I will see you next week. <laughs> I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. The sucker's going up.